All right, welcome back. Austin P. State University, Chapter 4 in our theater textbook. Um, today I'll be lecturing over what will probably be the most relevant uh, lecture I've given yet because you'll be needing to take notes on how to write your paper. Um, Remember, one of the requirements for this course is for you to see a live theater production. Now, we'll make a few exceptions to that. Obviously, those of you who are in active duty, um, thank you for serving, and uh, we'll let you watch a video rather than seeing a live production. We'll make accommodations accordingly. Make sure and let me know uh, early on if that, if you need an exception. But for most of you, going to the theater and experiencing this live chemistry in the air, the buzz of excitement in the audience, this is a big part of what it means to take theater and experience theater. It's not a dead art. It's not something that you can understand by just reading. You have to experience it to really get the full effect. So. So we're on page 74 in your textbook. Um, one of the interesting things that happens in theater is that the audience becomes as much of your experience of a show sometimes as the actors on stage. I thought it was interesting, the anecdote in your book about the Beatles. Uh, they actually hired girls in the beginning to come and scream and, and be fans of the Beatles uh, on the Ed Sullivan show, but then other women kind of fell into this hysteria Personally, I think understandably so. The Beatles are uh, some good-looking gentlemen, some attractive gentlemen. But, um, you know, this sort of mob mentality can happen. They talk about riots in one of the examples in your book, um, but also laughter. I had a professor in undergrad who was bad about cue laughter. He would try to laugh so that other people would laugh. But it is true that our experience of a play is generally just as much about the audience as it is the actors on stage. So that's something that comes with a certain responsibility for you as an audience member. Um, this is a really important term. And it means our ability to allow ourselves to be engaged in a play. And I have a picture of children here because they are the first to suspend their disbelief. Uh, children, if you say, I'm invisible, they're likely to go, yeah, you're invisible. Sometimes we as adults are more cynical or critical by nature. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched a, a movie where someone leans over to you and says, that would never happen. Somebody would never say that. You know, they're not suspending their disbelief. They're not allowing themselves to, to be engrossed in a story. They're still so critical that they can't enjoy or get into. And now sometimes that's the playwright's fault when you can't suspend your disbelief. Um, a perfect example of this is Twilight. You know, people say, well, that's not how a vampire acts. You know, like like they've met one and then they were told that that's, you know, uh, you know, you once the fantasy world is set up, once this world of the play is established, you have to allow yourself to be immersed in it in order to enjoy the show. So, um, like I said, sometimes a bad acting can pull you out of it. You know, if someone reacts like they've been shot before the gun is fired, then it's harder for us to believe that they're dying because we saw the bad acting. But in many cases, the burden is on us as an audience to let ourselves be vulnerable enough to be taken away by a play. Um, at the same time, I can kind of be balanced on page 76 it talks about at the bottom of the page your ability to be uh, semi-objective on the left here we have a Bertolt Brecht play now he was a German writer um, after World War II he went back to Berlin and staged these plays and he was not interested in any illusions he wanted the audience to know this is a story. We are faking it. Um, you know, no curtains. If you go to traditional theater, people vanish or come in and out from behind curtains. You can see in his staging of plays, no curtains. It's all exposed. It's all there for you to see because he wanted the audience not to get a kind of snowballed emotionally, but he wanted them to engage their brains and think critically. So he was interested in a more objective viewpoint. Um, and once again, that's Bertolt Brecht and his staging of his plays. Whereas if you go to see Little Mermaid on Broadway, here we've got the Disney uh, Broadway musical on the right there, part of your world. <laughs> there she's there with her dinglehopper. If you're a 
Little Mermaid fan like I am. Um, you know, they go to great lengths to hide uh, the equipment that makes that skate across the stage. They go to great lengths to make it appear as if someone's flying without uh, showing all the riggies and pulls that are hidden by curtains behind the scenes. So, um, in most cases, in most plays, in order to help people suspend their disbelief, we sort of use tricks and magic tricks, you know, but um, Bertolt Brecht and other more thoughtful plays, they want you to know it's a play and keep your objective distance. They're not trying to fool you. You can imagine coming out of World War II why you wouldn't want to be accused of manipulating anyone, especially if you're German. Um... Another way of kind of thinking of this actor relationship with the audience is how do we stage the play? There are two basic ways. There's presentational and then there's representational. So um, this is a great Broadway play that I saw. Well, I saw it when I was off Broadway. I'm um, called Peter and the Scar Star Catcher, and it was the story of Peter Pan before Wonderland. And um, uh, you can see that people are holding up this monster with their hands. You can see on the eyeballs, the red eyeballs, you see those are actors' hands holding it. Um, the actors are holding the mouth. And so this is a kid's show, and it's meant to invite you into using your own imagination to fill in the gaps. Okay, this is the Cheshire Cat. Uh, sorry, this is the alligator that, that, you know, the beast in the water that Hook is afraid of by the time we get to Peter Pan. But that is presentational staging. It's um, not meant to perfectly represent reality. It makes something that is presentational that you then fill in the gaps and you then create with your own imagination the rest of it. It's not trying to be a realistic illusion. It's um, it's just inviting you to imagine along with the actors. I think that uh, presentational staging is sometimes more fun. Um, it's more creative, kind of gives you that moment to say, wow, that's interesting, um, the way that they thought of doing that. So representational theater goes along with realism, and that is where everything has gone to great stakes to sort of uh, be exactly like reality. So an example here, this is Raisin in the Sun, where she's ironing on stage. She would hold up the shirt, we would see that it was wrinkled. We would watch her iron it, we would see the steam come off the ironing board. And then after she's ironed it, we would see that it was no longer wrinkled. This kind of just inviting you into realism takes a lot of effort on the part of a of a, prop maker. You can think about it as something like washing dishes. You have to run pipes in with water. Um, a, having a hot bath on stage. Uh, you know, something like that can really take a lot of time and money and effort. Um, but it was really important in the, around the 1800 when we started having, trying to make things exactly as reality represents it. So, um, that's representational theater, and most theater you go to will be representational. They will not look you in the eye. They will maintain the sense of this is everyday life, this is realism. <laughs> so this is uh, when they don't do that, when they, in this kind of staging, representational uh, staging, they'll only look at each other. They'll never look out into your eyes as audience members and have what Shakespeare would call a soliloquy or an aside, where it, he makes eye contact with someone in the audience and Hamlet says to be or not to be, and he kind of engages. Whereas, uh, and that's called breaking the fourth wall. This is a very famous moment in Ferris Bueller's Day Off when he looks into the camera and he says, they bought it, right? And then the music starts and um, he's breaking the fourth wall. He's engaging. Um, now, where does that term fourth wall come from? So if you can imagine on scenery, um, if we were looking into a box, it's as if uh, the room we just cut off one of the walls of the room and we're peeking in through the window almost. So um, if it's a living room, we've got the couch, we've got the recliners on either side, but the place where the TV might be, we remove that wall. So when we look through that wall and we actually make contact with the audience, make eye contact with the audience, that would be breaking the fourth wall. 
in the Alice in Wonderland video that you watched, Alice often makes asides to the audience making direct eye contact into the camera. And that would be considered breaking the fourth wall. So, um, when you go to see a live production, I've kind of put some links in there, some suggestions. If you're a student at Austin P, the easiest thing to do might be just to see the play at Austin P. Um, I've also put in the Roxy Theater in there, uh, a really fun free show, which is the Nashville Shakes. Um, and then, of course, if you're a different part of the state, just make sure you send me an email and let me know which one you're going to see if it's not one of the ones I suggest, because you may be in a different part of the state, and that's fine. I just want to make sure that it is legitimate theater. I wouldn't want you to go see a ballet or a uh, sixth grade uh, concert where they sing, um, you know, Yankee Doodle. I, it needs to be legitimate theater. It needs to be a two-hour show. It needs to be substantial enough to critique. And, um, you know, critiquing sixth graders is just cruel. So anyway, here are some etiquette. Please be good um, watchers of theater. <laughs> I'll never forget when a student of mine went to go see a, a show at another institution and he actually got in a fight with the director sitting right in front of him. He was bad mouthing the show at intermission. Never do that. Never talk about the show until after you've left the theater. He was bad mouthing the show at intermission and then the director turned around and said, well, you can just leave. And he said, no, I can't. I'm writing this paper for her. And then he said the institution I was working for, I was mortified. So remember, if you're going to wear an Austin P shirt, if you're going to represent, be a good diplomat of our institution. Please don't get kicked out and then it be in the papers. So-and-so is so rude. Um, so here's some common etiquette that you may not think of. A lot of these are similar to what you see in a movie theater, so it may not be new to you. Uh, and you may be a seasoned theater goer and already know this stuff. But, um, And we are on page 79, by the way. Make sure that your phone is off not on silent because then you know some app will beep or something turn it all the way off in fact if you can leave it in the car right um it, it says in your book beepers i don't know why you would have a beeper but uh i don't know maybe you're a doctor uh, but you know just turn your phone off make sure it's completely off on top of that don't think they can't see you if you're texting or tweeting or playing your game on your phone that is so rude and um, the same is true with anything that lights up a, th a camera a video camera you shouldn't have any of that anyway um, if it makes some sort of light uh, don't use it and something as simple as your watch right if it lights up uh, if it glows in the dark and you want to check the time that can really throw off an actor and I'm speaking from experience I used to be um, when I was in graduate school I also worked as the house manager so it was my job to kick people out if they were being disruptive and this was the most abused rule that I had I had to kick people out for texting uh, if uh, they thought it was boring um, just don't talk it can be really tempting um, to lean over and say hey that reminds me of the same time or oh do you see that uh, but it really can disrupt other performers if it's a musical that you're really aware of don't sing along it's just rude we're you know we pay money to see the real singer sing it so please don't don't be rude and start singing along um, if you have a cold uh, make sure you unwrap your uh, your cough drops before you come in I you know bring a little bag uh, and unwrap them because just that little twist of unwrapping a cough drop can be very disruptive also just try not to cough I know that's another hard um, rule especially if you're laughing then it can make you cough uh, if you're already a little bit congested my advice would be you know try to go to the theater when you're not congested uh, but you know it's not always that convenient um, uh, make sure you're there on time. This can particularly happen when you've never been to the theater before. You know, a week before, go drive by and find the theater. See what their parking situation is. Um, you know, a lot of you will try to beat 5 o'clock traffic to get there. Uh, leave yourself plenty of time. Most theaters have places to eat nearby. Uh, you can sit in the theater and read through the program before the show starts. Give yourself plenty of time because most theaters will not let you in. They just won't let you in if you're late. Um, it disrupts 
the audience when the door opens and the light spills in. It's not like a theater. Um, <laughs> don't eat anything. That's Charlie Chaplin with his fingers and his ears. Um, unless it's a dinner theater, uh, don't bring food uh, because it can be very disruptive. You may be a loud eater and not aware. Um, don't put your feet on the seats. Uh, as a person who's maintained theaters before, you don't realize how much damage that can do to your seats. Uh, you kick your feet a little bit hard and uh, the screws at the bottom start to pull out of the concrete or the fabric on the back of the the seats now suddenly needs to be replaced. Uh, we had a horrible vandalism when I was teaching high school. Someone came in with paint cans and threw them across the seats. Um, and uh, or actually they broke into our paint for our set um, painting and and threw the paint across the seats and it cost thousands of dollars in damage um, so please be respectful of those seats a lot of theaters as we've already talked about are on limited budgets and so avoid kicking the feet of the people in front of you avoid um, putting your feet on the seat in any way um, just be courteous and when you <laughs> this is a really silly thing uh, when you get up to get into your seat I prefer people to turn and face me rather than putting their butt in my face so if you've got to shimmy down a long row of seats um, turn and face the person you're scooting past I know that's a silly little thing but it's one of my pet peeves having butts in my face um, try not to wear too much cologne when you're going to be in a place that's so um, compact. A lot of people have allergies. I have a friend who is deathly allergic. Um, we can't even use incense at church because she's so sensitive to smell. So um, it can really hurt other people's experience of the show. So please avoid heavy perfume or cologne. Um, I have a baby uh, in this picture. Now, if you have a show that is catering to children, we're going to expect some babies. But in general, the, the real rule here is don't for any reason get up and leave the theater unless it's an absolute emergency. And if you bring a baby into a serious play, uh, you know, babies just have more needs and you're going to have to get up and leave uh, during some point. So just try not to leave unless it's intermission or the end. And Another temptation that my students have and that I'm particularly savvy to is leaving it intermission and just writing about the first half of the play. Please don't do that. Please be intentional about putting something about the second half of the play in your paper because um, I will ask you, did you, uh, you know, this is very much on the honor policy, but I will be very critical if you leave it intermission um, because I have seen that before, been cheated on, I keep my eye out for the cheaters um, and just don't bring a baby don't bring small children most of the plays that you would be wanting to see are not kid friendly so I mean if you're going to see Yo Gabba Gabba on ice then you know bring a kid but um, most of the, the plays that I've put links there to are not not children friendly um, that said Nashville Children's Theater is a wonderful children's theater if you have small children I highly recommend that for your project um, for you to write your play on they have a wonderful season and very engaging for very enlightening and educational experience for your child <laughs> the last thing here is uh, a piracy now obviously this is in a movie theater um, don't record the play uh, for one thing you'll spend the whole time worrying about your video camera uh, if you were doing this in a big playhouse a regional theater they're likely to fine you confiscate your your de recording device I mean they really have the law is on their side so it's not worth it it's really not worth it all of that is like we talked about last class copyrighted and um, you're breaking copyright like we said in chapter two just don't do it and don't take pictures don't take pictures of the set even before the show starts the set is copyrighted by the scenic designer um, don't take pictures during the show especially with flash photography can't tell you how distracting that is for me as an actor when someone takes a flash picture um, I thought it was really funny Aziz Ansari a comedian in his latest uh, stand-up special uh, he took a moment at the beginning of the play and said I know you guys are gonna take my picture so here let's just have a moment for everybody to take up my picture once again he is a performer knows how disruptive it can be um, to have those pictures now a lot of actors after the show will come out in the lobby and greet you and you can take pictures with them then with their permission um, but for the most part just don't do it 
don't do it. This is the number one rule of the theater right now. Please don't record or take any of that intellectual property without anybody's permission. You know, go home and Google it. A lot of theaters have promo pics on the internet. Share that picture that's done by a professional. They have um, nights, promo nights, where they are very intentional about staging pictures. It'll be a better picture anyway. <laughs> so this is um, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which is a movie. Um, but they have a scene in there about Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, Rocky Horror is an exception, obviously. Um, traditionally in Rocky Horror, they have the film showing and then they have actors acting it out. And you throw things, it's very messy. Uh, lots of transvestism as depicted in this scene. Um, it's very interactive. Obviously for a children's show, um, you can bring kids for a... Um, a, a theater that's serving like dinner theater you can eat uh, there are exceptions to these rules and those will be made clear in the program but if they're not clear then just assume that this is the etiquette you need to follow as you represent Austin P. okay so when it gets into buying your own ticket getting your ticket and that is considered part of your uh, cost for the class. Please don't come to me and say, I don't have the money for a ticket. You need to plan now um, to put some money aside for the show. And like I said, you know, most of the theaters I've posted here are not expensive. If you want to see a great show and you want to drive down and see a Broadway show at TPAC, uh, a touring Broadway show at TPAC, then that's your own choice. Uh, but for most of you, it's not going to be more than $15 for a theater experience. So um, we'll call is if you purchase your ticket beforehand and you pick them up at the theater. So for example, you might order your ticket online, bring in your credit card and pick up the tickets at the will call station um, at the box office. Uh, it's a window it'll be usually there's two separate lines you need to pick up your will call tickets at least 15 minutes before the show starts because after 15 minutes according to theater etiquette they're allowed to sell your ticket um, because they're interested in filling their house now that's just depending on how popular the show is but all of you whether you do will call or no should be at the theater at least 15 minutes before it starts most theater houses uh, sorry by the house I mean the audience area opens 30 minutes before the show starts so that you can find your seat, you can make yourself comfortable, you can go to the restroom, you can flip through your program, you've got plenty of time before the show starts. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and I'll say that terminology, I have students stop me when I'm in lecture and say, what do you mean by that? And uh, I have to kind of anticipate those questions. I s 15 minutes to curtain. Curtain is slang for the time that the show starts. So um, if a stage manager comes back and says 20 till curtain, that means 20 minutes until the show starts, um, the first time that curtain is drawn back. Uh, so that's uh, our latest trip to New York City. Those are some of my students from the Smyrna site at Motlo, which is why we took the picture with Smyrna uh, as a restaurant name. Um, what do I wear? Well, it's going to have to take some deductive reasoning skills on your part. If it's a big blockbuster musical, I would dress up a little bit, uh, you know, wear a tie, wear some heels. If it is um, a more edgy, modern play, you know, jeans are fine. In most cases, as a college student, you can get away with wearing, um, you know, jeans. It's not going to be that big of a deal, but, um, you know, also feel free to take the time to dress up. It's a fun tradition in theater. Um, you know, if I'm going to spend uh, $50 on a ticket to see a Broadway style show, then I'm going to wear heels. You know, uh, that's just my uh, opinion. Uh, that's on page 84, by the way. So it just matters what kind, if it's an outdoor performance, wear shorts and flip-flops. But if you're going to see a big um, commercial theater, I would dress up a little bit, wear heels and a skirt. Most people, if you go to the Tennessee Performing Arts Center, if you go to TCAP, most people are going to be wearing nicer clothes. <sighs> Once again, just take time for parking. Um, theaters are often in congested downtown areas. Now this is, you know, this is the theater district in New York. It's obviously very congested, but um, 
one of the biggest excuses I get, well, I couldn't find a place to park. Um, so just make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to negotiate the area. Um, take time to read the program. Obviously, on in Broadway, they're called playbills. Um, in when I was in England, you actually had to pay for a playbill. But most theaters that you go to regionally will have um, director's notes. They'll have actor biographies. Take a moment to read that, and I would challenge you to read it before the play starts, so that you have a good overview. And then take that home with you. It'll be a good reference for you as you try to describe the action. Please don't write a critique for me that's like the guy in the purple shirt. Take time to look up his name and use his name specifically. Um, also, don't be confused by the actor character delineation, which I have that on the handout as you write the critique, so just uh, be mindful of that. Take your program away with you. Um, don't try to write during the play. Just enjoy the play. Uh, this is not a very long paper, so you should be able to remember enough to write without taking notes during the show. Because, um, you know, trying to write while the play is going on is just going to be disruptive for you and for those around you. So, read the program and take it with you. It's a lot of great clues as to who are the experienced actors, what the direction the director is coming from, who had a note in it with producing it, who financed it, all that stuff. So you are having to play the theater critic. I have a picture here of uh, Mr. Ego from Ratatouille um, because a lot of people think of critics as these people who hate theater and I really um, I do think that a lot of newspaper critics are unnecessarily cruel they're sensational they're just trying to get people to buy uh, papers um, my favorite critic is Ben Brantley from the New York Times if you ever want to read one of his critiques to kind of give you a hint um, you can go to nytimes.com backslash theater and um, you can read some of his excellent reviews there of modern Broadway plays um, you know, a theater critic does a valuable service to the theater community. He uh, helps promote the play, for better or for worse. You know, sometimes a bad review can get as many people in the door as a good review. Um, it warns people about shows that aren't good if they don't want to waste their money, if you trust the critic. Um, so I, you know, I read critiques, and uh, obviously you're going to be critiquing um, and I would challenge you to think of yourself as a balanced person. Even if you hated the show, find some nice things to say about it. Um, it's easier to critique in many cases than it is to find something positive um, because there's no, there's no risk in that. Saying I hate that is the immature thing to do in many cases. Um, finding something that you agree with and being willing to say, I like this about it, um, then you put yourself out there. So try to find some positivity and some of you are naturally more critical and others of you are naturally more generous so I would challenge you to be generous as you watch the play open yourself up to the experience try to let it in try to suspend your disbelief try not to be a mean critic like the one in Ratatouille um so this is the really important part as we talk about historically what a critic has been um this is universal and uh something to think about. For those of you who get to the end of your text, um, your critique, and you need to add more content, um, these are some important questions to ask. But they should be preliminary anytime you're evaluating art. Um, what is the artist trying to do? And this is stepping back and being a little more objective. You know, it wouldn't be fair for me to sit down and critique a scary movie and say, I thought it was stupid because I don't really like scary movies in many cases. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, I'm not a big scary movie fan. So if I were to say, oh, well, that's stupid and gory, and I don't know why anybody would be interested in it, well, if they were trying to scare me, were they successful in scaring me, whether it's my taste or not? Um, if you go to a children's theater, Nashville Children's Theater, and you're like, oh, that joke is so corny and cheesy, well, they weren't trying to appeal to you. If the third grader next to you is laughing at the fart joke, then they've been successful. Um, if they were trying to make children laugh, then that's uh, the scale to measure it. So what were they trying to do and have they done it? Now, if they were trying to scare me and they make me laugh, 
they haven't been successful. If they're trying to make me fall in love with this romantic lead and I'm scared of him, then they haven't been successful. What emotions are they trying to provoke in the audience and was that successful? And then the third question, which is perhaps the most important question, is was it worth doing in the first place? Was the play that they chose a noble goal for them as professionals or was it a waste of their time and a waste of our time? Was it worth doing? What is the merit in the play itself? Okay, so those are some important questions. What did they try to do? Did they do it? And was it worth doing in the first place? So there's Goethe there. Isn't he handsome? Um, such a romantic. Now he's kind of the Shakespeare of Germany. If you've ever read Faust, that's him. Beautiful poet. <laughs> I always think it's interesting when I'm reading these critiques, I kind of get a little peek into your psyche, you know, because you're going to compare your experiences in life to that on the stage. So if you say, I don't think a mother would ever be that harsh with her children. Well, you're kind of telling me about what you think mother should be philosophically. So theater ends up kind of being this ink blot um, where you see what you want to see. And that's okay. You know, feel free to talk about your experience at the theater subjectively. What did it remind you of? Uh, what experiences have you had that mm, resonated with you in certain moments in the play? Um, because theater is an artistic and emotional experience. So uh, hopefully you know what an ink blot is. Psychologists show you this picture that's sort of vague and it's just blotted ink and you say what you see. Personally, in this one, you can take a little nose dive into my psyche. I think it looks like two dragonflies kissing. Well, that's just me. See the little wings on the top there? The little stingers in the back. Do dragonflies sting? I don't think they do. I digress. All right, so perhaps the most important, we go back to the very beginning with that famous guy we talked about earlier, Aristotle. He wrote a very famous short book called The Poetics. Um, I highly recommend it. It's nice and short. It's not going to take you all weekend to read it. Um, remember, Aristotle was a philosopher. And remember, we talked about earlier that Plato didn't believe in art or theater, but Aristotle, as his student, rebelled against him and said, no, theater is a worthy cause. So there are six basic things that he invites you to evaluate. The first being the plot, the beginning, middle, and end. Second being the characters, thought, language, music, and spectacle. So as you're following along, you should have six of these. We'll go back and cover them individually. This is an image that is probably not new to you. We have the exposition, right, the backstory. This is one of the hardest things when we get into playwriting. We'll talk more about that, but that's one of the hardest things. It's kind of inching in a sense of history. Then we have rising action and conflict as it builds to a climactic moment and then a denouement, right, the falling action. In most modern stories, the falling action is very short. Um, and then some sort of stasis, some sort of back to normal. So if you walk into my house and um, my father walks out and he yells into the other room, where's the such and such? And he's not wearing a shirt, right? That's my normalcy in my household, that we are loud and we are uh, sort of sloppy and silly. Um, now, if I walk into my husband's house, everybody's very respectful and quiet. It's not unusual for people to have their doors closed and be working by themselves in their rooms. So that's their normal, right? That's their stasis. Now, my sense of normal is different from his household's sense of normal, which is different for an action movie sense of normal. If in the first five minutes there's gunfire and five people die, then we know, okay, well, that's normalcy for them. And then we'll go back at the end to some other sense of normalcy, right? Whether it be with her or without her or with kids or they're married or everybody's dead on stage, right? We've got a new sense of stasis, but there's not this sense of fluctuation or abnormality. Aristotle thought that the plot was the most important. He called it the life and soul of drama. Your anticipation of what is coming next is what keeps you in your seat, right? Um, commonly thought of as a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, causality, right? In what Aristotle thought was a good plot, one domino falls and the other domino falls, and the action is a direct result of what happened before. 
So, right, good guy shoots a bad guy, and then bad guy's best friend comes after the good guy, right, because he shot the bad guy. There's a causality, there's a logical reason why one event springs forth to the next event, right? He sees her, he kisses her, he asks her out on another date, right? The, these things have a logical conclusion. Uh, and so, um, Aristotle's favorite play is Oedipus the King. Now this was a three-part series and although we have Antigone and Oedipus Rex, we don't have all three um, as they were performed in one day. Uh, we've lost a lot of these ancient Grecian plays, but I am going to um, tell you the plot of Oedipus the King as told in cartoons. Uh, just a side effect there. If you are American, it's Oedipus. If you are British, it is Oedipus, right? And his name is Sophocles. So I have drawn you a little over oversimplified cartoonery of Oedipus the king to tell you the plot. Um, so at the beginning of the story, there are two cities, Thebes and Corinth. Now, if you know anything about ancient Greece, Thebes was like where everything bad happened, right? And then Corinth was on the other side of the hills. Important to remember these are neighboring towns, and that's Little Shepherd obviously, with his little sheep. Um, now, when the show opens, he has all the citizens, they've had the plague, their livestock is dying, they're going through a drought, and they go to their king and say, obviously, there's a causality to this. All these bad things are happening, and we believe it's punishment from the gods. What are you going to do about it, Oedipus? How are you going to fix this problem? And so, um, Creon, he sends, when he knows all this plague and these bad things are happening, he sends his brother-in-law Creon to go visit the oracle and have the oracle tell him spiritually what's wrong with the universe. Creon come back, comes back and says that the oracle has disclosed that it is a person. So we're looking for a person to punish and then the gods will restore order to our town of Thebes. Um, backstory here he goes on to talking about the sphinx so the way that oedipus earned his right as king was to trick a, s a sphinx she had a riddle that nobody else could answer if you're not familiar <laughs> i'm sure my drawing does it justice there but a sphinx is a half woman half cat with wings kind of ordeal um and he was able to rescue Thebes from the Sphinx who was um, protecting the city gate. And so he reminds his audience, okay, I used to be good at this. I used to be able to solve problems and save the city. So then a blind, a blind prophet comes in and he kind of speaks in mystical terms that, that not everyone understands. But he says, you killed your dad and you love your mother. In other words, you're married to your mother. Um, and he says, how can that be? My parents are on the other side of the hill in Corinth, and I'm in Thebes. You don't even know my parents. Um, but of course, as the old tradition goes, the blind prophet has more sight than anyone. So then Queen Jocasta comes in, and she says, well, actually, I had a son with Laius, the last king, um, and we sent him away because there was a prophecy against him, and we were scared of him. So we sent him away. Um, and then, so then a shepherd comes in and says, okay, I was supposed to take you into the woods and kill you, but I had a heart, and so I handed you off to another um, cu couple, and they took you over to Corinth and raised you there, so you're adopted. So his parents' fear of um, this prophecy, he's finding out, okay, well, those aren't my parents, then who are my parents? Um, and he says, oh, I killed a king in the, in the woods once. This was a very honor-based culture. He came across them in a fork in the road. He killed the king, uh, not knowing that he was a king after being insulted. So two and two get put together. Jocasta realizes she's had children with her own son, and she hangs herself. Um, so uh, obviously she felt a need to have penance for this sin that she's committed of having sex with her son and then he goes over and takes the pin off of her robe and gouges his own eyes out and then he exiles himself he leaves the city wandering the earth blind 
and that is his penance. So if you've ever heard of the Oedipus complex, it's a child's desire to kill their father and marry their mother. It's based on this ancient Grecian play that is so sad and so painful. Um, the reason they told these horrible stories is because they wanted to have a purging of emotions. So they would get together and tell these very, very sad stories. They would all cry together and feel a sense of relief. For those of you who've had a good cry, you know that sort of ah, that comes with just letting all of that emotion out. And they believed that that purging cleansed their souls, particularly soldiers. There were quite a few of these stories that revolved around um, stories of war. And these would have, all of these men in Athens during the golden age of Greece would have kind of PTSD. So they would relive these moments and cry communally and let out these horrible emotions that they had. And the women would wail. It was a mourning culture. Oh, and that's a picture of Obama after a horrible um, tornado and uh, the news coverage just showing, you know, that sense of communal mourning that comes with um, horrible national tragedies. Okay, so the second of Aristotle's um, elements is character. He believed in order for you to get into a play, you had to have noble characters. Now, in Aristotle's sensibilities, that would have involved kings, royalty, um, the elite, the smartest, the wisest. Those are the people we need to focus on because that's who people can learn from. And um, in the 1800s, when we started the realism movement, we kind of turned away from that. Before that, remember Shakespeare, you know, Hamlet was a prince of Denmark. Uh, you know, all of the nobility were who the plays were focused on because they believed that those were the shining examples that everyone need to look to for better or for worse. And so um, obviously when we get into the 1800s, we change to realism. That's when Charles Dickens starts writing about a little orphan boy. That's when we change the stories to the everyday or lowly people. Um, now characters, their primary role was to move the plot forward. Remember, everything is a service to the plot. They were to take us from one place to the next. Um, they were to keep the action going. So we're not going to go off like Dostoevsky on these long passages about how they wear their hair. Uh, you know, this is primarily to keep the flow of action. They must be someone worthy of our attention, someone that for one reason or another captures our liking and our attention. And they must have a clear objective. We need to know from the first moments in the story what they want and where they're going. On top of a clear objective, we must have clear obstacles along the way. You'll never turn on a sitcom and have a simple solution right? You know, it may be something as simple as Jerry Seinfeld's got to go pick up his dry cleaning. Well, if he gets to the dry cleaning in the first five minutes of the episode, then there's no conflict. Remember when we said from the very beginning, conflict is the heart and soul of drama. There must be clear obstacles. There must be clear uh, problems for our main character to overcome. And they must be worthy obstacles. Um, you know, giant... Uh, monsters with only one eye or a golden sphinx uh, or you know all of these ancient Grecian sort of tests of character. So thought we're on page 91 and this is what does a play mean? What are the themes of the play? What universal truth can we get out by studying this play? Something you may not know about Aristotle is he was very religious. And the story of Oedipus is really about um, paying attention to the, what the gods say. If you have a message from an oracle, if you have a prophet or a prophetess um, come to you and tell you a truth, you need to listen. And that was really the heart of what Sophocles was trying to portray to his audience. If listen to the gods and the hints that they're giving you. What's the message of the story? Um, it must be a universal truth. It doesn't need to be something silly or trite. It needs to be something with some gravitas in order to be important. And um, remember what we said in the first episode about the first lecture about um, Aristotle believing that theater was a uh, way for us to observe our behavior and then uh, exact some truth out of it. 
Um, okay, so diction. And this has to do with how the playwright wrote the words and chose to arrange those words. Um, some of your plays that you see will be funny. Some will be poetic. There may be a line that you want to pull and say, I just love the way that they say that. That line resonates with me and I understand the way that the playwright wrote that. Remember, um, at this day and time, people would go to hear a play not to see a play. Um, and the playwrights in the ancient Grecian times were really the stars. You know, nowadays, your favorite movie, I bet half of you couldn't even tell me who wrote it. Um, you're more interested in the actors performing. But in that day and age, the playwright was the um, star of the vehicle. Um, so the music involves not only just in a musical, but if you have a straight play like a Shakespeare, how the actor's voice comes across comes across the um, clear resonant and dulcet tones the volume the tempo um, if you've ever watched a 1940s uh, play or movie you know that there was something called voice beautiful where people were interested in um, ah you're talking to me bub and they would have this sort of musicality quality of their voice uh, Oedipus is this is a silent movie version um, but you can hear this sort of some actors over exaggerated oh I am and it can have a sort of um, comic effect in some cases uh, even as late as the 1960s uh, you know uh, one of the greatest actors of our time is considered Laurence Olivier but if you go back and listen to Laurence Olivier who's a famous British actor the style of presentation that was popular then I think is almost comic uh, it was much more music musical and um, had this sort of I, what I would call pompous tone to it. So uh, it's important to know that those things kind of come and go. There are trends in theater to how a person should speak and uh, it also depends on who the playwright is. Um, the least important according to Aristotle is page um, 92 here, spectacle. What you see with your eyes. Um, most of what you see on Broadway is going to be a big spectacle. We're going to have um, lighting effects, you know, the spotlight's going to dizzy around the stage, somebody's going to walk out in sequins and do a kick line routine with jazz hands. It's all about spectacle. But remember in the ancient Grecian times it was we go to hear a play, not to see a play. Um, but spectacle involves everything that the audience sees with their eyes. And some of you are more visual, others of you are more auditory. So you'll be just looking for just different sides of the play that appeal to you. Um, and so I personally um, really enjoy spectacle. Art and the visual arts is one of my favorite aspects of theater and I part of that is you know me doing costume design um, when I went to go see The Lion King by Julie Taymor my mom had bought me a ticket and I went to go see it at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center and I kind of went into it very skeptical because um, at that time Disney was kind of taking over Broadway and it's kind of just a retelling of stories we already knew and I was thinking okay well, this is just a sellout show it's commercial but in the first 10 minutes I was crying my eyes out those big larger than life puppets came walking down the aisles on either side and they flowed with this beautiful fabric um, and it was so creative the way that the actors were using those puppets um, right underneath the cliff there you can see the leopard who uses uh, his hands to move the hands of the leopards front paws forward I mean the creativity alone was just breathtaking um, and so I say all that to say I don't agree with Aristotle and there are lots of people who don't agree with Aristotle there's an even kind of um, some people who are of minorities would say that Aristotle is a very Western viewpoint. August Wilson, who we talked about last class, he, you know, very much goes forward and says, you know, my plays are not plot driven. They have a plot, but it's much more conversational. You may, may remember him saying that. I'm much more likely to kind of go around the point and get to get to it rather than attack it straight on. So um, just to review, plot is the beginning, middle and end character is the agent of action, 
thought is the message that the playwright's trying to convey to us. Language is the word choice that the playwright uses. Music is everything you hear. Spectacle is everything you see. So that is the very important Aristotelian way of evaluating a play. It uh, was created thousands of years ago, but it still remains the most important methodology for play evaluation. So happy hunting on your play. I hope you find one that you can look forward to. I hope you bring a friend and feel good about supporting the arts financially. Uh, go with an open mind. Make sure that you are giving yourself emotionally an open experience where you're receptive and willing and giving the performers a benefit of a doubt. It's a whole lot harder than it looks. It's like I often compare it to the Olympics. You know, uh, when I first sit down to watch a diving competition, for example, I'm thinking, wow, that's amazing. I could never do that. And then by the fourth or fifth jumper, I'm like, oh, she did not point her toes, right? And it's easy to pay, play the critic. But if you really put yourself into their shoes, think about how many lines they've memorized. Think about how hard it must be to control your nervousness in front of all those people. Give them the benefit of the doubt and back, pat them on the back afterwards. Um, this is really, my goal is for you to learn to appreciate theater. If you see a play that you just completely did not enjoy, consider seeing a second play and spending time writing your critique about a play that you do enjoy. Um, because there's lots of good theater out there and there's no need to dwell on the negative. I would certainly hate for the only play you ever see to be one you didn't enjoy. So, you have your marching orders. Um, I hope you feel prepared. Remember these are due um, at midterm, so make sure that you go ahead and start looking now, saving your pennies, finding the play, start researching, getting on the internet. Part of your job is to find your own play. So um, remember if you have an exception to that, email me and let me know here in D2L. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>